deconstructing the past to help you make sense of today. Time for another award-winning episode of Pre-Nicene Perspective with your host, Darren Kalama. As new ideas start to enter the collective consciousness or intellectual ether, we find people scrambling to explain what it is or add their own spin to it to fit the narratives of a particular pet agenda or goal. And for better or for worse, such is now the case for our pre-Nicene Christian Bible, the very first Bible of 144 AD, which up until now has been primarily known and discussed within our little group, various circles of theologians, and among parishioners of the Marcionite Christian Church. But recently it was brought to my attention that that has kind of changed, and that a number of Judeo-Christian pastors have taken to the airwaves to discuss the first Bible, some more effectively than others. First, we ask ourselves, why now? Why this sudden interest now? Well, to explain that, I need to speak ex cathedra for a minute here to lay out the background, and then we'll get back to the official content guide portion of our broadcast. I think there's a few dynamics at play. First, people are looking at the genocide in the Mideast and saying, wait a minute, how is all this being done in my name as a Christian? Well, whatever this Yahweh war god is, it sure doesn't sound like it has anything to do with Jesus Christ. Now, you need to think about the full theological and real-world ramifications of somebody coming to that realization. That epiphany when they say, whatever's going on here isn't right, and I'm not stopping until I get to the truth of things. Long story short, through whatever mechanism or research they do, they end up finding the first Bible. They find out how Jesus actually came to earth. They find out that there is no barbaric Yahweh deity in the first Bible. There's only God as revealed to us through Christ. They find out Jesus transcends race and doesn't play favorites with any group, self-chosen or otherwise. They find out that God isn't somebody's personal real estate agent. In short, they find out their religion and Bible was hijacked by deadly parasites, or, as we read in 1 Thessalonians 2.15, hijacked by the enemy of all mankind. Well, now what? And again, I'm speaking ex-cathedra here. I think they go to their priest or pastor and say, how do you explain all this? How do you explain two different religions being stapled together and coming up with this Judeo-Christian Bible that doesn't even make any sense. Why aren't we using the first Christian Bible? Now, I'm not sure what these pastors are telling them in private, but I can tell you they've been all over YouTube and the radio trying to get ahead of all this and do some damage control for the Yahweh franchise. I mean, even Boeing has less PR problems than these guys right now. And by the way, I think some of them are truly doing their best here. They're driven to seek the truth, and given their limited understanding of pre-Nicene Christian history, they can only do so much. Now, I'm not going to spend the entire episode deconstructing their mistakes. We're here for an overview of the first Bible. But I do want to address a glaring misinterpretation that they all make. They sit there on camera like Boss Hogg from the Dukes of Hazard and pronounce, Yeah, Marcion was a heretic, and this is all just edited Luke gospel. Now, first of all, it's Saint Marcion, a saint just like his father, Philologus, the Bishop of Pontus, who was personally consecrated by the Apostle Andrew and was one of the original 70 disciples. So, we see the apple didn't fall far from the tree. Now, I'll stack St. Marcion's Christian lineage up against anybody, any day of the week. Secondly, when they speak of edited Luke gospel and compare it to the gospel of the Lord as we find it in the first Bible, it simply reflects the cartoonish version of Judeo-Christian history that they were taught at Bible college and seminary, or worse, on Google or some Reddit forum. Again, they're doing the best they can in a spiritual war. Unfortunately, they were armed with a mess kit instead of a rifle. Now, while they stand at attention, I'll lay this out for them. First of all, Luke wasn't an apostle. Luke never met Jesus, and the Gospel of Luke was written by an anonymous author, the same as the other three Gospels and Acts. Anonymous. 
But there really was a Luke, a physician, a doctor. And Luke was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. And after Paul received his revelation on the road to Damascus, he wrote it down in the form of the Gospel of the Lord and preached that gospel all over the Roman Empire, setting up new churches far and wide. Now, how do we know this? It's right there in black and white if you have eyes to see. Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And Luke was with Paul on these journeys. And Luke had full access to that gospel of the Lord. And what did Luke do when he left Paul? Oh, that's right. He wrote his own version of the gospel. You know who else was a traveling companion of Paul and wrote his own gospel afterwards? Well, that's right. Mark of Gospel of Mark fame. So when you hear someone say, oh, that's an edited version of Luke, you can correct them and explain they have it backwards. Luke is an edited version of the original Gospel of the Lord. Company dismissed. So, thank you for joining us as we review the contents of the very first Bible compiled and transcribed by St. Marcion of Sinope and published in 144 A.D., Originally written in Greek and transcribed from scrolls to codex format, which is the forerunner of today's books. Today we'll be using the flipbook version of the Bible to make it easier to follow along, and you can access that at theveryfirstbible.org and click on flipbook. Now, the first thing that we notice is that it's published by the Marcionite Christian Church, or marcionitechurch.org, and it has the church seal in the lower left corner. All authentic versions will display the same Library of Congress control number, which is 2020901841. Also, all authentic copies will have a Reference and study guide in the back, which is authored by A.W. Mitchell, Chancellor of the Marcionite Christian Church. Now, if it doesn't have the reference and study guide, it isn't authentic, and it's a knockoff copy that we've been seeing floating around there recently. It's disturbing that people would copy something that we give away for free and then edit it, but it is what it is, and it's the same problem we had with the gospel 2,000 years ago. So, what was once old? is now new again. Now, it's important to remember that this was the first and only Bible in use by Christians until 382 AD. Now, that's when the Catholic Church created its own vastly larger version of a Bible. Simply put, this is the original, unedited canon from which all else is derived. Now, the very first Bible is comprised of two main sections, the Evangelion, also called the Gospel of the Lord, the revelation Paul received on the road to Damascus in 34 AD, and the Apostolicon, also called the Epistles, or Ten Letters from the Apostle Paul to the churches that he established throughout the Roman Empire. So we begin with the Gospel of the Lord, which is comprised of 20 chapters, beginning with the arrival of Jesus on earth, where he took on a fully human form in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Now, that corresponds to about 29 AD, and then it ends with his crucifixion and resurrection just a few years later. This is the gospel preached by Paul in all of his churches and would have been widely disseminated and known among Christians living in those areas. Paul was preaching one gospel to us, the nations, but Peter and his group were preaching a completely different gospel specifically to Jews. Now, that's why they sound similar in some areas, but completely different in others. Now, for a deeper understanding of the backstory on this, we turn to Galatians 2.7, where we read, James and Cephas and John, those reputed to be pillars, the right hands of fellowship they gave to me and Barnabas, that we should go unto the nations, but they unto the circumcision. Now, it's worth noting that at the end of the final chapter, when Jesus visits the apostles after his resurrection, he emphasizes the importance of repentance. Next, we turn to the Apostolicon, the original ten epistles in precise order. It's comprised of Galatians, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Philemon, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Laodiceans, Colossians, and Philippians. 
you will note that the Judeo-Christian Bible of today has 14 epistles. Now, these extra letters are of unknown origin and are not canonical. You will also note that of the remaining 10, there's been a large amount of editing, additions, and omissions when compared to the very first Bible. Now, in our original Bible, we also find a prologue preceding each epistle. The prologues were written by St. Marcion and give us context pertaining to the contents of each letter. They describe the events, people, and circumstances surrounding the church that is in receipt of Paul's epistle. Now, researchers at the Marcionite Christian Church were able to determine that the Vatican Library is not only aware of these original prologues, but they have copies of them. Moreover, we also find that St. Jerome borrowed the original epistles from the Marcionite Church when translating his versions from Greek to Latin. And of course, direct Vatican Library links to these documents and images of them can be found at theveryfirstbible.org forward slash Vatican dot HTML. The very first Bible is now and always has been and will continue to be provided at no cost to anyone that wants it. It's provided in PDF, ebook, and audiobook format. Now, why does the church do this? Well, we find the instruction in 1 Corinthians 9.12. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Now, it's important to remember that this was the only Bible Christians had during the darkest days and decades of persecution by Roman emperors and Jews. For many, the very words you can read now would have been the last thing that they saw before death, paraded or staked in the Colosseums, awaiting death by Domnatio ad bestius, being killed and eaten by lions, and huddled in dark catacombs, whispering the name of Jesus as they tried to conduct a simple mass, or living under the 303 AD edict of Diocletian, when all churches were reduced to rubble and their pre-Nicene Bibles stacked and set ablaze. And all of this happened long before the Catholic Church finally got around to cobbling together their own version of a Bible in 382 AD. Remember, history matters, and that's why zealous attempts are made to erase and alter it. And lastly, it's translated from its original Koine Greek. The first Christian Bible is now available in French, English, Portuguese, and Spanish. And all formats have numbered chapters and verses. Thanks for joining us. I'm Darren Kalama, and we'll see you next time on Pre Nicene Perspective. Thanks for watching Pre Nicene Perspective and sharing it on social media. To download the Pre Nicene Bible and the flipbook used in this episode for free, visit theveryfirstbible.org.